Yes. Uh, I am a new addition to the teaching team. I found that uh, out about two months ago, sitting right over there in those pews when Tim said, teaching team, please stand up. And I didn't stand up. And he looked at me and said, you too, James. (laughs) Thanks, Tim. I'm still waiting on my shirt. (laughs) Uh, My wife and I have been attending Church of the Valley for about seven years. And we have uh, two children, Audrey and William. They're five and three, and they are in full little kids mode, as you can see from that picture. From literally running around the kitchen in circles, chasing each other, to acting like robots, to doing WWE-style hugs on the couch, they exude youthful energy and playfulness. And it wasn't too long ago that my wife was on Facebook Marketplace looking for materials to turn our house just a little bit more into a preschool that it is today, the preschool that it is today. And one of the things she found was something we now refer to as the kitchen set. This kitchen set is a full mock-up, small, just for little people size kitchen that has everything you might find in a real kitchen. It has a microwave, a fridge, a place to store your pots and your pans, You can see my son, William, pulling out a pie from the oven. I'm pretty sure that uh, I had to have at least five of those slices. Um, (laughs) and 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 they love to play with it. I was happy that she found it because I didn't have to assemble it. <laughs> and uh, uh, they often bring us things like birthday cakes and pizza and smoothies that we have to take with a smile on our face and tell them how good of a job they did and how much we needed that food right then for the 50th time that morning. The thing is, the kids and us parents, we we know it's pretend. We know that this is not real food, that this is not uh, what's actually going to sustain us. The real dinner is on the real stove, about to be put on the real table. And that, but this playset kitchen is a shadow and a copy, not just of the kitchen that you find in my house, but the idea of kitchens in general. And what it does is it points my children to the future where one day they will be the ones making food and serving it to each other and being responsible for their own daily needs. The the playset kitchen has many different kinds of utensils and appliances, and they all have a place and a purpose. There's uh, small burners that, uh, that are used to cook things. There's plastic spatulas. And sometimes they get used in the right way, and sometimes they get thrown across the living room. Is it valuable as a real kitchen? No. Does it make real food that does real good for us? No. But it does point, uh, but it does point my children towards a future when they will need to do those things. And this is an analogy. This is an analogy to what the writer of Hebrews is talking about in these 10 verses. Now, all analogies break down. Uh, but the tabernacle shadows the heavenly sanctuary much like a child's play kitchen imitates a real kitchen. The, now, the regulations and instructions on how to build and operate the tabernacle didn't come from an Ikea instruction set. They came from the Holy Spirit, and they have the weight of what it means to come from the Holy Spirit. When we say regulations, we don't just mean the, the speed limit you might have just fudged on your way here this morning, or uh, the NFL rule book that has flags, but we mean, uh, we mean the literal word of God spoken by Moses, spoken through Moses to his people on how to worship him appropriately. 
Let's look at Hebrews 9.1. Now, now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. There are two parts to this verse. The first part is the how. It's the regulations for worship. How do we approach God? The second part is the what and the where, the earthly sanctuary. Where can, on earth can we go to find and encounter God? The first, covenant prescri- the first covenant prescribed exactly how to do this. And it had all these regulations written out and followed by the Israelite people and embodied in the tabernacle. Why were these regulations given and an earthly sanctuary made? Well, we were just told in chapter 8, verse 5, they serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. That is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. We talked about what it means to be a shadow. Tim had his illustration of a mother in a grocery store and seeing the shadow on the ground. A kitchen set is a shadow of a real kitchen. But what does it mean to be a copy? When I was in school, which is getting farther and farther away as time works, we actually had these things called worksheets, which were pieces of paper that you couldn't type on, you had to write on. And I could tell that oftentimes these worksheets were copied over and over and over again. Probably some of them for 30 years. And over time, they would collect dust and spots and Some of them may have been black and... Most of them were black and white copies of what may have been color. And at the end of the day, you realize that this is not quite what it used to be. And that's kind of like the temple. It has the information there. It has the representation of what is in the heavenly sanctuary. But it's just a copy. It's in black and white. It is not in color. But there are two things we can know. There's something here that we're supposed to learn. Something that we're supposed to know about the heavenly sanctuary based on what's in the earthly tabernacle. And two, it's not quite there. There's something still yet to come. And we will see what the, that information is in a bit. Uh, but we can very quickly feel that this is not quite what it's supposed to be. Now, we've talked in, in this series, we've talked a lot about who in the tabernacle. We've talked about high priests, how Jesus is the perfect high priest, how there were other priests that were insufficient. But now we're going to talk about what and how. And Hebrews 9, 2 through 5 starts talking about that what. Verse 2, a tabernacle was set up. In the first room were the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This Ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the Ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. Well, right over Hebrews, I have time. (laughs) So if the earthly sanctuary and the worship in it is supposed to point towards a heavenly holy place, uh, what what is it pointing to? I've given you two illustrations already of what that might mean. And because of the rule of three, I'm going to give you a third. Who here has ever been to a new city? Anybody? Yes, most of us have gone traveling somewhere. And when you go traveling, you inevitably end up staring at a stick in the ground with some words on it, trying to figure out 
if the red arrow is you or the place you want to go to. I know that today with Google Maps, which can now navigate me through the drive through of In-N-Out, I found out yesterday, uh, that it's not, as cus it's not as much as it used to be, but almost inevitably, whether it's at a zoo or in a mall or right in the subway, you're going to be staring at these signposts. And that's what the tabernacle is like. It's like a signpost pointing us to our destination. And it's even harder when it's in a foreign language, isn't it? So we need to know what the language is that that signpost is written in. And the, and the language of the tabernacle is the Hebrew experience, the stories behind these objects that were just listed out. These, the, these verses, verses 2 through 5, address the objects of worship, but not all of them. There are many more objects in the tabernacle than, was list, than were listed off. Why did the writer choose these objects? To know that, we need to know more about the objects themselves. So here is my quick history lesson on what these objects were all about. So first off, we start about the tabernacle itself. Lit, often referred to as the tent of meeting. It is the place where God is dwelling with his people, amongst his people, as they travel around the wilderness. Um, I have a list on the next slide of the what. So we have the tabernacle, and inside the tabernacle, there are two rooms. There's the outer area and the innermost holy place. And in the outer sanctuary, there is the lampstand. This lampstand, literally the word for it in Hebrew is menorah, and it looks kind of like what you might see at Hanukkah, except there are less arms. There's only seven, and it was made of one pure gold bar, which cost a talent. Now, if you're wondering how much is a talent, according to what I looked up on, on Google in about five seconds, it's approximately $300,000. This was not your lamp at Target. <laughs> this was, uh, and this was maintained and constantly lit by the priests. Next to the lamp on the, ta on the table was, called the, was the consecrated bread called the bread of the presence. This bread was, was 12 loaves divided into two piles of six, that sat there for a week as an offering to God, but then at the end of that week, it was replaced. And it was re when it was replaced, they didn't just throw the bread out, it went to go and sustain the priests who were working there in the temple. Past the table where the lampstand and the bread is, we have a curtain that separates the outer sanctuary from the inner sanctuary, where the God dwells inside the tabernacle in the inner sanctuary. And we pass by that curtain and we see the altar of incense, which, uh, which was good smelling perfume as an uh, offering to God who was in the room and it filled the room like God filled the room. We have the Ark of the Covenant. On the Ark of the Covenant, we have... Uh, we have the mercy seat, which is the top, uh, and overlooked by the, cher the wings of the, cher of the angels, called cherubim. Inside the Ark of the Covenant, we have a jar of manna, we have stone tablets, and we have a budded staff. Now, most of these things, I'm sure like me, you guys are probably familiar with, but when it came to Aaron's budded staff, I was like, what the heck is that? I have never heard of Aaron's budded staff before. What is this thing? So I went to look up what this was all about. And uh, this comes from Numbers verses, uh, chapters 16 and 17. And it's a whole story. It's uh, lots of stuff, and I'm going to try and summarize it for you rather than read the two chapters. This story starts out like many of the stories 
in the Old Testament. The Israelites were grumbling. And what were they grumbling about? They were grumbling about the fact that Moses and Aaron were being, were being talked to directly, uh, from, uh, directly from God instead of him talking to the whole people. And if you don't remember who Moses and Aaron were, Moses was chosen by God to lead his people out of Egypt, and Aaron was his brother, the one who spoke for him, the one who accompanied him many places and did the signs and wonders, and eventually the one who establishes uh, the line, who is chosen to establish the line of high priests for Israel. So the Israelites, they're grumbling, they're rebellious. Three of them, specifically three of the leaders of this, this grumbling, come up to Aaron and Moses and say, who are you to be so, uh, who are you to set yourselves aside? Are not all God's people holy? And Moses and, and these three guys go back and forth for a little bit. There's things that happen, and eventually uh, God gets angry at these rebellious Israelites, these leaders, and he opens up the earth underneath them and swallows up their whole families and household, and, uh, and uh, you think it's done. What do the Israelites do when they see the leaders of this rebellion be swallowed up by the earth? Exactly the same thing that you and I would do. Get more rebellious. <laughs> and they start to complain to Moses and Aaron again. God is angry again. He thre- he's like, I'm going to put an end to this grumbling by putting an end to these people. Moses and Aaron, wait, don't do that. Stop the plague. Uh, let's do something else. God relents and, uh, and says, okay, instead, I, I do need to put an end to this grumbling. So, in number 17, verses 4 and 5, he tells um, everybody to, he tells the leaders of the tribes of Israel to bring forth a staff that represents each leader. And in starting in verse 4, he says, place them, the staffs, in the tent of meeting, in front of the Ark of the Covenant law, where I meet with you. The staff belonging to the man I choose will sprout, and I will rid myself of this constant grumbling against you by the Israelites. So all the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel Israel, place their staff in the uh, tabernacle. So there's 12 staffs there. One of those leaders being Aaron, the leader of the tribe of Levi. And what happens? Levi, uh, Aaron's staff sprouts. But it doesn't just sprout, it has blossoms and it produces almonds, which, is in, uh, which yet again, God goes on to show that he does more than he, he promises. And you're wondering, that's nice, James. Thanks for giving me that Sunday school lesson how does this, what does this mean to me? How is this a sign or a signpost or a shadow of what's in the earthly sanctuary? The point is that every single one of these objects, when you think about them, points to Christ and his ministry. Every single one. From the bread of the presence, which is literally the bread of life to the priests in the temple just as Christ is our bread of life, to the lamp, which is made at great cost to be the light to the world, to draw people into where God dwells. We have the altar, uh, the altar of incense that gives sweet smells to God and lifts up, just as it describes in Revelation 5.8, uh, that the prayers of his people are like incense to him. We have the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat where the blood is sprinkled on it, uh, overlooked by cherubim, just as cherubim are at the beginning in Genesis over, from, the time, uh, from the time that we, the first sin and the fall happens, overlooking the garden all the way. They overlook everything uh, that God reveals all the way to Revelation where they shout, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, and they declare Christ, the slain lamb, as worthy. We have inside the Ark of the Covenant, 
we have a golden jar of manna. That manna is bread from heaven, again, with bread being a representation of Christ that comes daily for God's people from heaven to earth. We have the stone tablets, which represent God's law and his um, holiness, which Christ fulfills in order to be a pleasing and acceptable sacrifice. And then finally, we have Aaron's budded staff. And if you stop and think about Aaron's budded staff for a moment, this is the staff that Aaron uh, held out before Pharaoh, and it turned into a snake. This is the staff that was held out over the Nile, and, tur- and God used it to turn the Nile into blood. Through this staff, God performed many signs and wonders that led his people out of Egypt into salvation. But not just that, when God's people wanted a sign of how do I know who is supposed to be an intermediary between us and God, God took dead wood and made it alive again. But not just alive, he made it sprout and fruit and give off fruit, just like Christ's resurrection identifies him as the only one who can produce fruit in our lives and be the true mediator between us and a most holy God. Every single thing in this tabernacle points to Christ 1,500 years before he even stepped on the earth. The question then for us is how do we mistake the signpost for the destination? One, I have a story that I think illustrates how today we can do that. When I was about 10, my, uh, the pastor at my church was clearly looking for a way to get people a little bit more excited about the gospel, a little bit more engaged in church. He was he wanted to change things up. So he did radical things like have breakfast during the early service or had service out on the lawn near the street. And for most of these things, my family was fine. My parents were okay with it. They appreciated and loved this pastor, which had been our pastor ever since I was born and since my parents had moved to, the, to, to my hometown. But there was this one day I recall specifically when the pastor decided to change things up with communion. Now, this church is a church where the recipe for the communion bread was written into the bylaws and had to be made by an elder the week before communion was supposed to happen. This was basically the most radical thing he could have done was go to the store and buy a loaf of bread. And he took that loaf of bread and he put it at the front, and instead of passing the plates around, he had people come up and tear a piece off and dip it in the juice. And I, when this was happening, I looked over at my mother, who I had never seen not take communion in her life, and I could tell the, sh- the shift in her mood. Her lips pursed, her arms folded over her lap, she straightened up a little bit, and she sat there. And I said, Mom, are you go- aren't you going to come take communion? And she said, no, not this time, you go ahead. Later, after the service, I asked her about why she didn't take communion that, night, that day, and she said, she, get, she had her reasons. Um, something, something about not wanting to uh, show off or have my relationship with God be on display or stuff like that. But even at the time, I felt that those were just kind of excuses. And looking back, there were a lot of people in that church who were so tied to the way that we did communion that it was a stumbling block to actually worshiping and encountering God that morning. How have we done that in our lives? And you'll notice in that story that there's not just a change in what is being used, but there's a change in how they do it. And the next 
five verses, uh, the next five verses in Hebrews talk about move on from the what to the how. And the point, uh, and when we talk about how things happened in the tabernacle, I want you to understand that the point of it is that the, the things that were done in the tabernacle show us our need for a better way to do things. We're, we are about to see contrast between how uh, Christ comes and allows us access to God and how the tabernacle does. Verse 6, when everything has been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. Just like Ruth mentioned last week, there is a huge contrast here between what Christ has done and what the priests of the tabernacle have done. The priests of the tabernacle have to go in regularly, all the time. Christ is, Christ's work is finished. But Christ's finished work is not just about what takes place in the outer courtyard, but what takes place in the most holy place, which is described in verse 7. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. So this, pre, this offering for sins you don't know you committed only happens once a year. What's happening the rest of the year? You're doing incomplete sacrifices. Christ's work is complete. Not only is his work finished, but it is complete. You know, I often, uh, I was thinking about uh, how the priests in the temple often ha had to repeat these steps over and over again to try and get right with God. And I thought about, um, have you ever been the friend or had a friend where you had to, uh, where they continually tried to make things up to you by doing things that you liked? Maybe they would miss a hangout or uh, disappoint you in some way, and they're like, don't worry, I'll get it for you next time, rain check, or let me make it up to you, here's a gift I got you. At, but it just kept happening over and over and over again. They keep trying to do things on the outside, but ignoring the problem that's on the inside, the problem of the relationship that's been, that's been broken. And this is described in verses 8 through 10. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way to the mo into the most holy place has not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the, end, until the time of the new order. Here is, yet the, here is now the final contrast between Christ's work and the work in the tabernacle. Christ's work is internal where now the Spirit dwells. I, haven't, I did leave out one object when I was talking about how they point to Christ. The object, it, does anybody know what that object was? Anybody catch it? It was the veil. The veil separated the, inner sanctuary, the outer sanctuary from the inner sanctuary. And when Christ was crucified, what happened to it? It was torn in from end to end. Now, because of Christ's work, we can go into where God dwells. But not only that, He chooses to dwell in us with His Holy Spirit. Instead of a tent that moves with His people, but yet is apart and separated, God moves with His people every single 
morning and afternoon and night. And we can rest in the fact that God dwells in us and we can dwell with God. When we look for a series of steps to make it up to God, we're only fooling ourselves. Just like, now just like the toy kitchen that doesn't produce real food that satisfies, the point of the tabernacle was never to make us right with God. It was to make us aware of our need for something more. To give us the form of what would come So that when Christ did come, we would know his voice. But like children, still today, we try and cook up some holiness in our toy kitchens with fake burners and plastic ingredients. But God is not calling us to that. God is drawing us into the tent of meeting where in confidence, in the confidence of Christ's work, we can encounter the most holy one, And because he chooses to be with us. It is my prayer for this week that we encounter him and dwell in his presence however he chooses to make that happen. Please bow your heads with me as we ask God to make our relationship with him a little more real this week. Dear Lord, thank you that your plan for humanity has always been to remove the separation that we put there. Thank you that you sent your Son and did the impossible so that we can dwell with you and have peace. And Lord, I pray that this week, that is not just a thing that we look towards in the future, but that we realize is now possible today. And Lord, I pray for anyone here who might have stumbling blocks preventing them from approaching you because they are tied up in the way that they do things. I pray that you remove them and that you remove those stumbling blocks and that you point them to a relationship with you that satisfies. In Jesus' name, amen.